My name is Peter Becker. Um, I work for Esri as a product manager, specifically looking after imagery. Uh, I've been at Esri for about 14 years, uh, focusing really on our imagery products, and a lot of that time has been spent on our image server products, and specifically how to get those working in the cloud. This is a pretty big subject, and I want to try and refer to this presentation as a crawl, walk, run, sprint. What I mean by that is that's the speed at which this presentation is going to go. I'm going to start relatively slowly, generally relatively easy things. And as the presentation goes on, it's going to get more complicated, and the presentation is going to go faster. But halfway through, I'm going to put up a slide which will start talking about architecture. After that, there are quite a few URLs and stuff there. I don't expect you to write them down. There is a URL which will come up. If you just go to that URL, you can get the rest of those slides and just download them and just click on the URLs as opposed to frantically typing them down. So just so sometimes I see people frantically trying to write the URLs down, we'll make it easy for you and just give them so you can just download them. Okay? So what we're here for is trying to make imagery accessible for visualization and analysis using the cloud. Um, diagrammatically, we want to go from an on-premise, typically, into a cloud environment. Or we want to go from an on-premise into a partially cloud environment. Some people want to do mixed. What we want to try and avoid is anything that looks a bit like that, basically. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, what you have to realize also is that the concept of just taking what you have in an enterprise and uploading into a cloud and rep repeating what you do on an enterprise is not going to work. The cloud is very different, and you have to realize that there are things that need to be changed when you try and move into cloud environments. So first, what is a cloud? It's basically it's the ability to use a network of remote servers hosted on the internet to store, manage, process, and process data rather than local server or personal computers. So that's pretty easy. Uh, so it's the idea of, yeah, you, you want to basically rent equipment in somebody else's infrastructure and utilize that in, 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 in basically in the cloud. So what's different? Uh, one is the implementation and management of that infrastructure. That infrastructure is different to what you'd have on premise. You're talking about things like EC2 machines, um, EB, um, EL, um, ELB storage, lots of different acronyms around. Um, the storage model is different. Um, one thing is that in a cloud, you don't have a file system. Well, you have file systems, but it's a good idea not to use them. And instead, what you typically want to use is object storage, uh, certainly for imagery where you have vast quantities of it. Uh, it's the only really inexpensive storage that's available. What you want to do is to make use of the elasticity and scaling capabilities in the cloud. Basically, scale up and scale down as required. You don't have to purchase the infrastructure. You just rent it. You want to be careful on security. Security in the cloud is very strong, but there are lots of different security models, and you need to try and understand those. You have a pay-for-use cost model, uh, which you need to try and utilize. And one way to do that is to do a test and scale. What we mean by that is that instead of trying to pre-plan everything and create this, what you would typically do in an enterprise environment, you try and plan everything and say, I want how many of servers and how many of this and how many of that, and then purchase it. In the cloud environment, what's really nice is you can start small, you can try something out, test it out. If you want to make it bigger, just get some more compute, make it bigger. If you want to make it smaller, make it smaller. So it's very, very flexible in that way, and you should really try and make utilization, use of that. So why do you want to manage and serve imagery in the cloud? One is you have very large collections. Um, you may have huge collections of imagery in the cloud. Typically provides relatively inexpensive way of storing it. Um, Often, your own infrastructure is getting expensive and hard to maintain. You've probably heard that the cloud is cheap, secure, elastic, resilient, and simple. Um, I won't give you a test on which is true and which is false. I can assure you they're not all true and not all false either. Um, so there are certain things which are better in the cloud. It's, it, it has its, um, there are certain things which are more complicated. Or your organization may be going cloud first. Uh, we're seeing that a lot of organizations are realizing that they prefer to put everything straight into the cloud as opposed to doing it themselves. From an infrastructure perspective, there are lots of options. Um, ArcGIS Online is a cloud. It's a SaaS offering, um, and I'll be going a little bit into that. And currently, you can really take or upload into the cloud tile cache and serve that back, um, either as base maps or as elevation data. 
Uh, we also directly support AWS and Azure, um, but you can also imp implement ArcGIS on other clouds as well, although uh, AWS and Azure are certainly the easier cause, easiest because we provide a lot of um, tools in, in, in both those environments. Quickly stepping back and looking at imagery, and when we look at the actual complete platform within ArcGIS, we break it down into five components. There is the management of the imagery, and that's really what this is going to be about. How do we manage imagery and how do we disseminate it and make it accessible to users? You also have to realize that there are other parts of the, of the ArcGIS imagery platform related to, for example, map production, which is the creation of products from that imagery, from satellite, aerial, or drone imagery. You may want to create digital terrain models and and author photos, that's what you, those, those tools are what you use for that. There is the analysis, which is the extraction of imagery. Um, that might be in a desktop environment, but you may be wanting to use a cloud, infor, um, cloud environment and use, for example, Image Server to do automated feature extraction or run deep learning against imagery. The visualization exploitation is really about utilizing that imagery and the information that you've extracted from that imagery into applications that provide informative or provide interfaces that give users informed, allow them to make decisions based on informed, appropriate information. And then there is the whole aspect of the content. The content may be content that you get from ArcGIS Online. It may be content that you get from a number of partners, um, or it may be content that you actually have within your organization. So today, we're really focusing on the management component of it. And from an, um, um, from an ArcGIS imagery perspective, there are a lot of capabilities to work within all sorts of different um, imagery and image type data. When we talk about imagery, we're very loose in the word imagery. We actually mean anything which is gridded, rasters. Um, we even actually refer to LiDAR data as imagery, although it's not really officially imagery, but it's, it's all managed and handled a very similar way. So you may have different sensor platforms, you may have imagery from different satellites or drones, or you may have categorical data or scientific data. This data may be optical, it may be thermal, it could be radar. Um, you have different modalities. Is it multispectral, panchromatic, it may be complex radar data. It may have different levels, which is really the level of processing that is available from the vendor of the, um, of the data and sometimes is referred to as a product. And that refers to the pixels and the metadata associated with it. And you may get the data in all sorts of different formats, from TIFF, NITF, and CDF. There are a whole range of different formats. And some formats are better, than, or, or, or better in the cloud than others. And we'll come back to that later. The way imagery is managed within ArcGIS is to use a mosaic data set. This really enables very large collections of imagery. It's an optimum model. It's very scalable. You can manage a single image, or you can manage tens of millions of images in a mosaic data set. It's defined either in a file geodatabase or an enterprise geodatabase. When we say defined, we're not trying to put the pixels into that database. We're using that database to reference the other imagery and then define, um, the, the reference the source. We maintain the meta information in that database. We also define the processing of how, how to transform the pixels from what's stored on disk into a product. Within that mosaic data set, we can define rules for how to mosaic it uh, and create what are called overviews when you zoom out. You can basically see low resolution images. And it provides two things, dynamic mosaicing on the fly processing. Dynamic mosaicing is the ability to reorder the imagery so you can determine what image is at displayed on top. And on the fly processing is the ability to take any pixels and process them to, for example, create different um, band combinations or vegetation indices, or perform things like orthorectification and reprojection and all that sort of stuff. So that's really the, pro the processing of the imagery. And those mosaic data sets are then accessible either as an image that you can work with or as a catalog that can be used for querying. So the image server is the key technology that we have for serving that data. The, key, the image server has four capabilities. Image hosting was actually added at 10.7.1, and that's the ability from anybody within, if you enable it, it allows anybody within your organization to upload imagery into, um, um, into the um, um, server and serve that back. And one of the examples I'll be showing is that, because you might have hosted your, you put your image server in a cloud environment, so you're uploading it into the cloud. The second one is the dynamic image services. This is, it creates these web accessible layers uh, which, can, which can perform this processing on the fly. The third is the raster analytics. This is the ability to persist. If you define the type of processing you want and you want it to be, be processed over a very large extent at high resolution, you can implement raster analytics which quickly processes it, that data by distributing the work over multiple machines. 
And then author mapping is really the, the, the tools which are used to process satellite and aerial imagery into product. It does things like aerial triangulation and DTM extraction. So very advanced tools. They're all cap capabilities or, or part of um, image server. Just quickly, is what we mean by raster analytics is really the ability to you know, take various data sets and then um, from, um, from various clients, make requests, and those requests can then be distributed over multiple machines. Uh, this, can util um, this is very useful to use in cloud environments where you can say, I want to have 100 cores or 200 cores or two cores, and you can scale it up, and yet actually the system will distribute that work over the available um, cores within the cluster to execute work very, very quickly. And this is now able to actually process and perform tasks that were pre previously had to be done in literally supercomputers, uh, can actually be done in, um, in, in raster analytics, because we've incorporated a lot of very advanced algorithms to perform not only what are called local functions, but also what are called lo global functions. Hydrology is an example of that. So. Let's have a look. If we want to implement a complete imagery solution, what are the components that we need to think of? One is the storage. Basically, how are you going to store the original imagery that you received, and also maybe the optimized. Maybe I'll talk later about optimizing imagery and the reasons why you want to do it. You may store it in the same place. You may, may decide you want to store the source data locally, and you may want to store the optimized imagery in the cloud environment. You have to determine where you're going to do the management. Are you going to do the management of the data locally, or do you want to do it in the cloud? You have the option of very often of generating tile cache. I'll come back to why you want to do that. Um, and that, again, can be in, done in different places. You can serve that tile cache, either on enterprise or on the cloud. You can serve the dynamic image services. This is the ability sort of to, to quickly work through, work with, with the imagery and do on the fly processing. You can perform the analytics. And then you have to also consider the access control, which typically by that I mean, are you accessing it through RTS online, or do you want to access the data through your own RTS enterprise portal? So where should each one of these processes be performed, either on-premise or on the cloud? So you have choices at where you want to do it, but one thing you need to ensure is that wherever you do the storage and the processing, they better be close together. Don't have any ideas that you can put the storage in the cloud and do your processing on-premise and it's going to work. It will work, but it'll be miserably slow. You really want to make sure the processing needs to go to wherever the data is stored. So where you store the data is actually important because your processing really needs to be there, otherwise you're doing a lot of data transfer. So what we want to do is to actually look at these different options as in storage. You said on, you can store it in a file system or an object storage. That's available. You can, you, you have a file system exists in the cloud. I've marked it as pink as something I'd rather you suggest you don't do. Similar object storage does exist on premise, but typically you wouldn't bother. You'd use, use a cloud storage for that. Similar for the image management, um, you can have various options. You could actually use RTS Pro, which is the primary tool for managing data. But I'll show you how you can use a web portal to manage data. Or you may automate it. Uh, realize that everything that we're showing you here and talking about is stuff that Esri actually does itself. If you know about the Landsat services or Sentinel services or, or World Elevation services, those are services with petabytes of data which are made accessible to you as image services. We use exactly the same workflows that I'm showing you here to manage our own data. Okay? Um, so a lot of that is automated. Uh, the Landsat services update every day. The Sentinel services update every day. I can assure you there's nobody managing them physically. They are automatic, automated processes which automatically update the Mosaic data sets and publish everything and keep everything running. Um, so automation is something you want to look into. Serving tile cache, um, you, can't, you, um, you could do it um, um, well from online. Obviously, it has to be in the cloud. But if it's on premise, um, or using ArcGIS Enterprise, you could you implement that on the cloud or on premise. Similar for the, um, the image, dynamic image services, you can actually use enterprise with image server or just standalone image server. And we'll be coming back to that. And then you have um, to do the analysis and author mapping. A lot of people actually do it directly in Pro but you obviously can scale that up with RTS Enterprise and Image Server. And then the actual portal I'd mentioned before, there's a choice there. So there are a lot of options here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically identify four best practices. Okay, so these are, we recommend, you've got lots of options. I think mathematically, there are like 224 or something options there. I'm just going to basically focus on four, which I consider the best practices. So. Let's work on the first one. The first one is to manage locally and then cache to ArcGIS Online. And it's 
amazing how many, you know, for a lot of people, that's really all they're looking for. A lot of organizations have a collection of imagery that an organization has collected for them. And really all they're looking for is to have a background map that they can put in online and serve to their users as a background. You don't need to have your own server for that. All you need to do is to cache the data, upload it into ArcGIS Online, and let ArcGIS Online serve that data. So you're keeping everything in a local file system. You're using and managing a mosaic data sets. You review the data, do your quality assurance, and then you generate um, tile cache, hopefully in ArcGIS Pro 2.4, and then you package it uh, using what's called a TPKX, and that package is then uploaded into ArcGIS Online and published to ArcGIS Online. Cost-wise, it's about 1.2 credits a gigabyte a month. Very roughly, um, but you can see the figures there. It is actually very inexpensive to serve imagery that way. Um, and these base maps or this image, these tile caches are accessible as base maps in really all your applications, as well as it also supports elevation data, which can be used as in scenes. The advantage of this, it's very simple and it's very inexpensive. Um, there is no server to install, and you have your data in the cloud. The disadvantages. You need to pre-process all the data, so you have to pre-process it. And what you're getting really is only a three-band RGB or elevation data back. Uh, it's not really usable for any types of analysis. It's not totally true because it actually some of the deep learning algorithms can actually use this tile cache as an input. But you're very, very much limited in your analysis capabilities, and you certainly can't do this dynamic mosaicing, reordering, or querying, querying the data. But for a lot of users, this is a very suitable um, 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 way of doing it. There are a lot of number of caching tools. Um, I s suggest strongly you use ArcGIS Pro 2.4. A number of improvements were made in it. Um, but there are basically tools to generate the tile cache, manage the tile cache, export the tile cache, share, share, that, um, share it, and then uh, serve, serve that to ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, note also that tile cache, when it's created, actually can be added back into ArcGIS as a, as a raster, and so can what we call a TPKX, which is actually a zipped or packaged version of that tile cache. Um, as I mentioned, use 2.4. There are a number of enhancements, and um, that also includes the use of what's called a TP, TPKX. Now, Another way to do it is we've actually provided a custom tool. The, the standard tools are good. They've been developed over a number of time, but there are a lot of options in them. So what we've actually come up recently is to create a custom GP tool, which you can download from the imagery workflows. The URL's there, but you'll find it later. And that allows you, it provides four simple tools, which allow you to create the rasters, package it, and upload it. And I'll just give you a very quick demo of how that actually works. So here I'm in ArcGIS Pro, and I have a mosaic data set. A mosaic data set is a, is a, is a, um, a data model. In this case, it's referencing a bunch of images. And if I open the attribute table, you can see the images that it references. There are a, lot of, there are a number of presentations this week about um, mosaic data sets, but you can manage the data. In this case, it's just three images. It could be millions of images. So once you have a mosaic data set, what you want to do is to, to cache it, or it could be an individual raster. Here is this tool that I, I was saying. You can just say uh, create raster tile cache, and it'll ask you the input. It's just the mosaic data set. It's going to ask you for a folder name where you actually want to put this stuff. I'm just going to put it into temp, temp folder here, give it a name. I'm going to call it sample B. And um, it's going to ask for a tiling sc a scheme. I'm going to say it's going to be the same as ArcGIS Online. And it asks me for three scales. What scale do I want to cache the data at? It's given me, it's found out that the data is about 60 centimeters. So it's giving me that as the default. Just because we want to get this thing to run really fast, I'm just going to change that to sort of 19, uh, 19 meters. It's going to ask me for the minimum dis display. Now this is really, if I zoom out, how far should it cache, and then also the maximum display. In other words, until what resolution should it display the imagery? Remember, it's going to be cached at 19, 19 meters, but I only want to display even with subsampling down to, let's say, four and a half meters. And then I can, if you want, define an area of interest. You can define some polygons and say, I only want to cache what's inside this. And you can define a parallel processing factor. You run that, and that runs pretty quick. In this case, it's going to run very quick because I'm only doing it 19 meters. Um, so this will run through and generate the tile cache. That's done. Uh, and if I actually go back to my, um, um, folder, uh, my, my folder here, 
and do a refresh. Let's go down. You'll see that the sample B is added. I can drag and drop that in. If I turn that off, there is my, it's basically mosaic, those images together. And I have an image. It goes off when I zoom in, as I just defined. And uh, you have the image. So that's the first step. It goes, goes can, obviously, how fast, it, how fast that goes depends on how much data you have. Once you have that, what I can then do is to say um, um, package and publish. I can run that. It's going to ask me for the input tile package, uh, which is what I just created. Uh, sorry, the input tile cache, which is what I created, sample B. It's going to ask me for an output folder. I'm going to put it into um, the same temp folder to make a difference. And it's going to give a name, so sample B. Uh, I'm just going to top package. It's going to ask me, do you want to upload it? Yes, I want to upload it to ArcGIS Online. Um, this is now connecting to ArcGIS Online. It's going to ask for a summary. Text, test, tags, test, credits, me, uh, description, nothing. Um, so I can put what I want in it. And it asks me, do I want to make the tile package um, public? I don't want to. Do I want to share it? Yes, I do. Which group do I want to do it? I'll leave it as a as a as a um, as the default. And do I want to actually publish it as a hosted image layer? I'm going to say yes, and then I run. And this is now going to package it, upload it, and very shortly we should actually see that available as a service, a tiled service within ArcGIS Online. So, as I said, it's doing. It's, it's relatively simple. You can do it on very very large data sets. If you actually go back to the tools, there are some other tools here. For example, um, which are quite interesting. This is actually to update a tile cache service. That means if you uploaded a big data and then you found ah. You made a mistake and there's a small area that you have to update. You can actually use exactly the same process and just say update, and it'll actually merge it into whatever is in ArcGIS Online. It also has a create tile cache metadata. If you're managing your data with Mosaic data sets, there is metadata there. And what it can do is extract that and create a feature service that you can associate it with your tile cache. So when you go identify on the tile cache, it'll tell you the date of the images and things like that. So those sort of tools are, 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 are built into that. Uh, that should be finished by now. And if I go to my um, uh, ArcGIS Online account and refresh, it still hasn't come up. I don't know why. Uh, sample B. Uh, geoprocessing. No, it should. It's done it. It's probably still working on it. And in ArcGIS Online, it's still working on it. Uh, should come up. We'll come back to it. It's basically processing in ArcGIS Online. It'll appear here as a, as a, as a service, uh, service soon. And then you can access it within, within your various applications. So it's a very powerful tool or useful tool uh, to get your data cached very quickly. So. The second practice is to actually use ArcGIS Enterprise Plus Image Server at 1071. I mentioned it had a host image hosting capability. So what we're doing here is you're going to use ArcGIS Enterprise and Portal with a portal. Uh, and what we're going to do is to uh, the, well, the source imagery um, can be any local imagery or it can be referenced imagery in a cloud. I'll show you how to do that later. And there are, various, there are three options to it, which I'll come back to in a second. And with that, you can actually use what are called shared instances. I'll explain that a bit later. Uh, and what's nice about it is one, if you do this method and you upload and use the image hosting capability, you can utilize the raster analytic capabilities that are part of the system. So all the, all the, 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 the persistence of complex data and processing of the complex data can also be used with, with using the raster analytics. So it's simple. Anyone in your organization can do it. Uh, it utilizes, it enables you to utilize the full raster analytics capabilities as well as things like author mapping. Um, and it can be implemented either on premise or in the cloud. It's a matter of implementing ArcGIS Enterprise in a cloud environment and you get this. The disadvantage is um, <clears throat> it's um, limited to simple um, mosaic data sets. Um, so it, you can't really do complicated um, processing and define processing control uh, processing on it. And you have actually no control over the mosaic data set properties at the moment. So it's limited optimization. And it certainly requires somebody within your organization to have set up ArcGIS, ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, <clears throat> so 
The hosted imagery capability, basically it's part of the portal user interface. You upload or reference imagery and you have an option. And it's easier just to actually um, sh show you this. So here I actually have um, my organization and I go to the content of my organization. Ah, oh, uh, hold on. Uh, now I know why. Now I know why it wasn't. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong portal before. This is the one in ArcGIS Online. I was looking at my portal, not in ArcGIS Online. Remember, that's the cache that I actually created. I was wondering why it didn't appear. Uh, so this is so this is the, the the cache that I just created in the in the previous demo. Uh, it did actually create it. It's actually there. Um, okay, so here's actually my portal, and with my portal, if I go to my contents. And what I can do is to create, and what you see in create is there is a new image layer. So I can pick the image layer, and it'll give me various options. One is to, first one is to create one image layer that contains a collection of all my input images. What that means is if I've got 10 images, it's going to mosaic them into one single image. The second op option is to create one image layer that contains an, a mosaic of all the input images. That means if I have 10 images input, I'm going to create one layer, one image service, but internally it contains 10 images, and I can control the order of them. It's a mosaic data set in behind the scenes, and I, can, I have properties, and I can control various aspects of the imagery. And the third option is I multiple, create multiple image layers, uh, one for each um, input image. That means if I create load 10 images in, I'm going to get 10 layers back out again. So let's just take the first one for the time being. You can also import different data. It can just be a raster data set, which is just like a, you know, a GeoTIFF file or something like that. But you can actually also input various information from different sensors, Landsat imagery or QuickBird imagery, WorldView imagery. There are a lot of different sensors that are supported. And similar to the capabilities within ArcGIS Pro, you can define various properties on how to perform, perform different processing, band combinations, author rectification. There are a lot of different properties can, can actually be, be set. From a user perspective, what I do is I browse to the imagery that I'm, I'm interested in. So we're going to go back to CTemp. I'm just going to load those, those three images, go open. And what it's doing is actually starting to upload those into my portal. So it's uploading it from my local machine into my portal. Um, I can go next, fill out some various uh, uh, um, things like the title. Uh, Um, so tags, uh, summary, and where I want to um, save it and go create. And now this is actually, once the data has been uploaded into my cloud, it's actually in this case going to mosaic it into a single image and then serve it back to me. Now that is not necessarily only a three band service, that can be four bands, elevation data, anything that I want is, 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 is essentially supported by, by the system. So that's creating a proper, proper image service. So we let that run for a while. So that's, that's um, the, the way of, of, of using ho hosted imagery. The next one, the next uh, option is to use but that's not using Pro and has quite a lot of limitations. That web interface is nice, but it doesn't have the, the capabilities that ArcGIS Pro does. So the second op third option is to actually use ArcGIS Enterprise plus ArcGIS Pro. You actually load Pro into the cloud. Let's say you've loaded your data into the cloud, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and you then run ArcGIS Pro in your cloud. If you're an Amazon, for example, you start an EC2 instance, you install Pro on it, and you have Pro running in the cloud. Um, so the source can be from really any data source. It can be uh, well, from, from what we call it, sorry. It can be from a data, source, data store, or it can be na cl um, native cloud storage. That means public cloud storage, such as S3 buckets that might be hosted by Amazon or others. Um, you're actually utilizing ArcGIS Pro to manage the data, uh, to manage the imagery, and um, you create your mosaic data sets. Uh, you can store your mosaic data sets, preferably in an enterprise geodatabase, and you can reference it using what are called an ACS, VSI, uh, VSI or raster proxies. We'll get some more details later. And what's nice, again, again that you can actually utilize the um, um, raster. Um, you can utilize ArcGIS uh, raster analytics for the distributed processing. So you have the full capabilities of the mosaic data sets in this option, and you have the full capabilities of the, all of raster analytics and author mapping. Disadvantages, you have to actually set, 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 have a separate machine for ArcGIS Pro. That's not really a disadvantage. It's just 
you can do that. And again, you need DevOps to actually inst in install all this. And what you do is you create your Mosaic data set, and then you can just use this share as web layer. And then when you do that, you have various options, and that includes whether you're going to reference the data or you want to copy the data. And uh, if you, you say reference the data, then your pro, the data it's stored in accessible in Pro must be accessible by the server. If you say copy data, the, the data will actually be copied to the server. Obviously, you don't want to use the copy data when there's a lot of data. You're just creating a copy of everything. So that's relatively easy to do. Uh, the next option, option four, is to just use standalone image server and ArcGIS Pro. So in this case, the first part's the same. We're going to use ArcGIS Pro to access the, um, to, to manage the data. But in this case, we're just going to, we're not going to use the full of ArcGIS Enterprise. We're just going to use the image server. We're going to install image server on its own. Um, and again, we store the data in, in typically in an in, in enterprise geodatabase. The advantage is here we have the full capabilities of the Mosaic data sets, but we have lower infrastructure costs because we don't have the rest of ArcGIS Enterprise. Then again, we lose the capability to rerun raster analytics and the author mapping capabilities and image hosting capabilities. That's not available. But if you just have imagery that you want to put into a cloud and serve just as dynamic image services, you can do that. And then maybe you just register that service with ArcGIS Online and use ArcGIS Online as, let's say, the portal for that image service. A typical example would be things like the Sentinel services and Landsat services. They are just standalone image servers in the cloud that are accessible, and you access them through ArcGIS Online. So um, um, as I said, you can either use a direct server connection, or else you just create an item in ArcGIS Online that references it. So how you do that? Uh, within ArcGIS Pro 2.4, it's one of the improvements in 2.4, if you use the share as web layer and, you're, and it's connected to a server that is not federated with an enterprise, it'll still work. It'll just publish it directly to the standalone image server. So that was something that was added at, at, 10, uh, at Pro 2.4. Uh, there is actually a, uh, a published image service tool. Um, it's part of MDCS. It's part of the imagery workflows. And that is actually another a UI which does something similar. It'll actually work in, two th in version 2.3 of Pro as well. Uh, but it cr not only does it pub do the publishing, but it also creates the imagery layers for you in ArcGIS Online. Uh, and it can also determine, you can also define whether you want to use dedicated or shared instances. We'll come back to what that means later. So um, there's not much of a demo for that. You just, there's a, there's a GP tool, I mean, literally, in, in Pro, what I would do is I, I'd run it. Here's the tool. I publish, go and there's some things you fill in. You go publish, and it publishes your Mosaic data set. Um, so, so that's what I've done is given you sort of four options from very simple to more complex, from limited functionality to a lot of functionality to a little bit more limited. So there are a number, there are a number of different options. So let's go, go and dig into what is required to actually implement this. And this is the slides from now on. The slides, there's, there's the URL. If you, want, if you want a copy of it, just type that URL in and you'll get your slides so you don't have to type in all these URLs. So here is an actual recommended um, infrastructure for ArcGIS Enterprise with Image Server in a cloud environment. In this case, I'm using AWS as an example. Um, in, in Azure, it would be very, very simple. Uh, you have your um, ArcGIS portal, and that typically is connected with a ArcGIS um, a GIS server. They could be combined. Typically, you might keep them separate. The GIS server typically has a, a data store that might be used for the features. And then you connect your analytical servers, in this case, image server. And what we're recommending here is two separate servers or server clusters, one for the dynamic image services. These are the services where I pan and zoom around, and the server is processing the data on the fly and returning it back to me. Yeah, so you have servers to do that. And then we recommend you keep separate the raster analytics servers. These are the servers which you're going to basically give a request to, and it's going to process and do a lot of a lot of processing, maybe over hours or minutes or something like that. That's going to consume every resource that it can get its hands on. And if you combine it with the dynamic image services, then somebody goes pan, and obviously the server is doing its work. Uh, so it's better to keep those 
that's why you typically keep those, keep those separate. Uh, so typically you'd have a cluster for each. You could connect, for example, notebook server, and maybe some of you have actually um, listened to some of the discussions about notebook server. It's also very powerful and works in combination with these, with, these, with these servers. Here you'd have another EC2 instance, which has got RTS Pro. Remember, this instance may only be running while you're running RTS Pro. When you stop using RTS Pro for data management, just close the machine. You're not going to pay anything for it anymore. Um, and what you then connect it to is typically um, the different storage. You may have internal storage, a raster store, which is just an S3 bucket that you've defined. Or it could be external public data that might be connected to. You typically have a, um, a, a data store as an RDS. So this is a, as, as an enterprise geodatabase. Typically, we don't actually, although there is an enterprise geodatabase inside the portal, we don't typically recommend using that. So here, we base, what we recommend is to put it externally. And you actually do need a file, st file store. So although I don't like using a file store, the, uh, the infrastructure does require a small file store to exist for certain temporary files, which get actually have to be still copied to a file system. Uh, so there is actually a file store. So this is a typical. A full ArcGIS Enterprise implementation. And this is what we required for options two and three of what I've described before. And the prerequisites uh, are really that uh, you, know, you need, you, you, um, um, there are a number of prerequisites. I'll let you, you look at the notes later, but just realize before you start implementing this, there are a number of things that you need to find. For example, an SSL certificate. Uh, this is basically a certificate that identifies that you as an organization are who you say you are, and uh, um, various elastic IP addresses. So there are a number of, this is like just a list of things that you need to really do before you take the next step. And this is for Amazon. The Azure one is very, very similar. Um, so to actually implement it, remember I said we're going to start, I was going to sort of walk. We're starting getting to the run stage, by the way. I'll come to the sprinting later. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so basically, you're setting up RTS Enterprise. Um, the way you do that is typically is in, using um, what we'd recommend for imagery. And this, in this case, would be to use an Amazon an MD5 2x large. Typically, you might have one instance of that. Uh, so there are, what's nice is they're cloud formation templates. They're various templates which will set this up for you. Uh, for the image server, um, you can use the same M M M5 M5D 2x large. Uh, typically, I would recommend two instances of that with auto scaling. Uh, and then you would use a, um, a DB R4x large, and that would be used for the RDS for the, for the um, um, ent enterprise geodatabase. Uh, so, so, you, so this is really the, the things that you set up. If you want to run raster analytics, the raster analytics setup is really exactly the same as the image server setup. So well, you can later go down and download these, these templates, and uh, they can be used to quickly set this up. There are various actual options for setting up these uh, ArcGIS Enterprise in cloud environments. In, uh, in AWS, uh, there are actually three key ways of doing it. One is to use the cloud formation templates. The second one is to use Cloud Builder, and the, S the third one is to use the AWS Command Console. Uh, if you ask different people, everybody has their preferences, so I'm not going to give a specific recommendation. Um, but there are some advantages and disadvantages in, 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 e in, 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 in each of them, and it depends how comfortable you are with utilizing um, uh, things like the AWS infrastructure as to which, which one of those templates or, or builders you actually want to use. Uh, similar in Azure, um, the, um, the, the options are, are less. We basically just pr pr primarily pr um, provide ArcGIS serve, um, the Cloud Builder, and those are the URLs for that. Again, you just go to them, and it'll show you exactly how to set up um, 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 Azure. So the next one is the option of actually using um, um, Standalone. Uh, the standalone is really exactly the same as what you saw before, only it doesn't include the ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, but otherwise, we have the, the, just the dynamic image server. What you're seeing here, mind you, is typically we run it in a siloed mode. Uh, and that provides, in other words, you have basically multiple machines. And each mo machine is really independent of each other. And it's, it's, it has a, um, a load balancer in front of it. Uh, and that really distributes the load between the, 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 image, the, the dynamic image services, servers. And they connect, again, to RDS and the file stores. Um, so the image server deployment uh, is very similar, an MD, MD5, M5D 2x large. You may wonder why this M5D. M5D is actually an option of a server which has got a thermal drive. Remember I said in, the, on, on a, in a cloud, typically you have cloud storage, or the blob store, which is 
which is used for the large amount of data. And mo the f um, the, some of the machines have an SSD drive which is connected directly on the, next to the CPU. And we use that for caching. Yeah, and that's where, that, in that case, the file system is good. It's not a shared file system. It's a file system dedicated to just that computer. And that works really, really well. Uh, what doesn't work very well is if you have a file system as a share somewhere where multiple web computers are connecting to a file share, that is something you would, you would, it's better to avoid where possible. So in this case, that's why we use the M5D, because they have ephemeral disks uh, in, in the order of, I think it's about 280 gigabytes just sitting there. And you can use that for uh, um, cache, caching data. So, um, so that's really how you, how you can install the, um, the image server deployment. So one thing that came up in, in actually 10.7 and has been enhanced in 10.7.1 is the ability to, when you set up image services, is to differentiate between dedicated and shared instances. So the de dedicated instance model was the one that we had before, which was really the idea that whenever you create a service, you define the minimum and maximum number of processes which are going to be dedicated just to that, um, that, that service. So you have a service A, and you say, oh, I'll have up to 10 processes that run on it. And when people start using it, those processes will start up and wait for requests. And when requests are there, they'll start working. Uh, the problem is you have not only one service, you have 100 services, and each one you've allocated 10 processes to, and now you have 2,000 processes running on your server. Uh, and obviously, there is a scaling problem there. So the shared instances are slightly different. In the shared instance model, you actually create a pool of services. You say, OK, I'm going to create a pool of, let's say, 100 process, uh, uh, what we call socks or processes, which are running. And that pool can be a pool for 1,000 image services. And whenever somebody comes, makes a request, it'll actually take one of those processes from the pool and utilize that. It'll keep that in memory until it's not being used for a long time. Then it'll throw it out, and it'll be replaced by another process. So that has the advantage that it's much more scalable. We can handle thousands of, of services. There is a potential drawback. The first time somebody hits one of those services, it does need to warm it up a little bit. And that's about 12 seconds if you're using an enterprise geodatabase. Uh, so it's not too long, but you have to realize there is a slight delay. And that's why if there is a service which is continuously used, it's better to use the, uh, or very often, or you want very fast start up of it, it's better to use the dedicated instances. If you're a general image services, it's better to use the shared instances, because you can have more. Another thing is the file versus enterprise geodatabase. I mentioned for, for small mosaic data sets, it's OK to use a file geodatabase. Uh, it's when they get large, it becomes problematic. The reason is the file geodatabase is relatively chatty. Every time you pan and zoom, it's going to check that database. And that database is partially stored in memory, but it's referencing a, some, a file on disk. And therefore, it's going to check that file on disk. Did anything change on it? Uh, so that becomes problematic when the mosaic data sets get very large. So in the cloud environments, remember the file having a file sh shared file system was, I said, not a good idea. So in the cloud, it's actually better to use an enterprise geodatabase. An RDS instance in, 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 in AWS would be advantageous. Or in, in Azure, use an SQL server. So typically, as I mentioned before, don't use the portal. Um, the, um, um, we don't, although the portal has an enterprise geodatabase, we typically don't use it for the, for the mosaic data sets. You can use a file geodatabase on a file share. Um, but I said it doesn't scale very well. Um, the alternative is to actually have the file geodatabase, have a file geodatabase, but copy it from the blob storage to the ephemeral disk. And this is becomes very, um, especially when you're on the standalone image server, that's what we very often do. We just stand up. Remember, the siloed image servers means that as the machine stands up, you can actually say what it should do before it starts. And one thing you can do is put your mosaic data set, zip it up, put it into a storage, and then as the server moves, stands up, it just copies it from the storage onto the ephemeral, really fast disk that's right next to the CPU, copies it there, and then starts up that server. It takes maybe a couple of minutes for that server to start up, um, but it means that that's, uh, it actually has a number of advantages, because that, then you can actually use the file, very effectively use um, the file database. So cloud storage options. As I said, there's a file systems. File storage is, is the concept of using SMB. You know, uh, this is your typical C colon slash um, you know, file system. Um, it's not cloud native. It's OK for small data sets. Um, it's OK for caching. 
um, really what you want to utilize for the large imagery is the object, uh, object storage. It's much more inexpensive. It provides shared access. That means multiple machines can access the same object storage. It's REST-based. Um, it basically works with HTTP type requests. It's nearly unlimited in size. I mean, object storage can go to many petabytes of si in, in size. You have higher latency, mind you. If I make a request to an object storage, it might take 40 milliseconds for that request to return. 40 milliseconds doesn't sound very much, but when we're talking about accessing thousands of images and each one has a 40 millisecond delay on it, uh, things, things can, can delay. Uh, so it has a higher latency, but it does have high throughput. And that's why, because of that latency, this is why we actually do this, this caching that I, I'll talk a little bit about later, about how to actually put, um, improve that performance to reduce the latency in it. So the optimum is actually to use cloud storage to store the massive volumes of data, but then actually cache the data using the cache the data that's accessed on the ephemeral on the ephemeral disks because very often in imagery you go back somebody pans they pan a little bit later they come back to the same place you want to make sure that the system is not continuously going to this massive data store which takes a little bit longer to access. So using cloud storage, there are three different storage types. Uh, well, there is a there are. Uh, in, in cloud storage, you can basically access it multiple ways. One is to use the native um, access, and what we mean by that is that within ArcGIS and the imagery, you can go slash slash VSI curl or VSIS3, they're various what are called VSI uh, um, commands or raster proxies, and that's just directly accessing uh, um, the data. Um, so the, the disadvantage of that is it's only going to use a single um, um, account. You can't really have multiple storages with different security settings and then access it using this way because each one of those storage systems wants a different password or, or access keys and this method only allows one of them. The second option is to use cloud, uh, um, what we call ACS which is a cloud storage connection file. This is done in Pro. If you go to Pro just like you create a connection to a database, you can now create a connection to cloud storage. And when you create that connection, you enter credentials. You can define credentials a different way. You enter those credentials. Those credentials are then stored in that ACS file. And you can open that connection as if it was a very similar to a local file system, but it's actually connecting to the cloud storage. And you can browse the files, select the files, and add them to ArcGIS. When you create your Mosaic data set, that ACS is embedded into it. When you then send that to the server, the server now has the connections. It has those credentials that you put in are basically passed through to the Mosaic data, with the Mosaic data set so that the server can access it. So that's really good. Um, it's, um, it's a good system. There are some disadvantages to it, um, but um, it's, a, it's a good way of accessing, accessing the data. And the other one is to use a cloud raster store. Uh, so this is actually created with RTS Server Manager, and this is really a way of actually pointing, um, pointing to um, storage, and that's typically used for both reading and writing. So this is when you do raster analytics, and you say the output of my raster analytics, I want to write somewhere. You don't want to write it to a file system, you want it to write to cloud storage. So you create what's called a, um, a, a cloud, or cloud raster store, and then you can define that as being where the output of your, your processing is to go. So those are sort of three different ways of actually um, using the cloud. Um, with the security in cloud, there are, there are multiple ways of handling it. Uh, everything from just making the bucket open and saying there's no security on it. Um, it's surprising how many buckets are like that. Uh, anybody can access them. It's just public data. It's OK. Anybody can read, um, can read it. The other one is to, cr to use a similar public uh, public um, access, but use basically a no list option. What that means is that if I know the URL of a file, I can access it, but if I try and go to the URL and say what's there, it will refuse to give me a listing. And you can consider that by obfuscation. You can create a file and it has a really weird name that nobody will ever guess, and if somebody has that URL, they can access the file. If they don't know that URL, They'll never be able to find it or anything else. But if they give that URL to somebody else, they'll be able to access it. Think of it as if you, you took your, your, your data set and you put it on a thumb drive and you gave it to somebody. It would be the same concept. If they gave that thumb drive to somebody else, they could also access it. Yeah? It's just that it's just a small, very small, um, basically a URL. And that URL could point to a gigabyte file or a terabyte file somewhere. Then there are other options, uh, IAM roles or uh, role-based access. Uh, depending whether you're an Amazon or Azure, uh, you can actually set permissions by user. You can use pre-signed URLs. Um, in, in Azure, it's called a, a, a SAS. 
uh, or shared access keys. This is sort of token-based access. Uh, you can use access control lists. Uh, this really gives you the ability to define permissions at a file at a file level. So each machine, each, just like on a file system, you can right click and say share this file with somebody. You can do the same thing in the cloud environments. Or you can use bucket policies, which provide very fine grained control. Um, and that can actually be used what's called a canonical ID. It's the ability that somebody says, I give you my account name or my canonical ID, and then I can say, I will share all my data with that. If you have that, if you're a system who has that canonical ID, you can access it when nobody else can access it. So there are lots of options of, 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 of working with it. Um, do check. Um, there is a, um, there's a cross-origin, it's spelled wrong, I thought I corrected it. Um, cross-origin resource sharing. If you have data in the cloud that you want to have accessible from web applications directly, and there are some web applications that can directly access um, data in the cloud, uh, be careful of that setting because that can actually stop those apps accessing it or, or set it depending how you want it accessed. So what affects performance? Um, performance is access um, by the volume of data that's read, um, how efficient the process is, things like latency, bandwidth, and data structure. There are lots of things that affect. Um, affect the performance in the cloud. What's good to know is that we put a lot of effort into trying to optimize every single one of them. We minimize the number of requests that go to cloud storage. We cache things where required. Uh, we do a lot of, lot of things, and there are a lot of best practices for how to manage the data to, to really increase the performance. For example, using footprints in, in Mosaic data sets. So there are a lot of best practices on how you create the Mosaic data set, and we also put a lot of technology into the system to really improve the performance in cloud. One of the things that does affect it is how this data is stored. There are lots of different formats for storing data. In, for, for, for storing data. A lot of people get data in what I call um, um, stripped or uh, um, um, striped um, TIFF, which is really just um, it's very simple TIFF files, but certainly some of the older TIFF files are that format. Then there's their files like NetCDF and GRIB, uh, which are very often used for multi-dimensional data. Then you have GeoTIFF, which can have lots of different flavors. You have something called COG, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, and then there's MRF and CRF. These are all different formats, and each of them have advantages and disadvantages. So, structure, so it, it is important to make sure you have the data structured correctly um, because it has, can have a massive effect on the performance. If you have a badly structured file, it takes a lot of requests to read it, and that will slow it down. So it puts a lot of, lot of put, put a load. So um, you can do that. By, it's better to optimize the imagery, and you can do that prior to uploading the imagery to the, to the cloud um, or as part of the uploading process. And that's actually done with something called optimized rasters. I'll come back to that. This is just a quick overview of file formats and why they have an effect. So this is what I call the, um, the striped TIFF. It's just one pixel after the other. Typically, you might have metadata about the file somewhere. This is typically very slow to access. Much better is tiled TIFF, where you have the metadata and the index, and then you actually have the data cut up into tiles, and typically you have pyramids. That means if you zoom into an area, the system only has to read some of the data as opposed to the whole, 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 whole strip. COG is really exactly the same as tiled geotiff, only the pyramids are moved to the front. That's really the only difference in COG. What you don't want to do is to use formats such as NetCDF or HDF and GRIB. These typically spread the data and the metadata around the file. So to read it, you've got to do a lot of reads to find out the bit of the file you want. So again, as if, um, from, a, from a format, COG is, this is, this is going back what, what Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF is. Another option is MRF. MRF is very similar. It's only we actually split the files up. The splitting of the files can have some advantage in, in cloud um, because of the way that caching is performed within, the oper um, within any environment. Actually having them as separate files means the systems can cache those little files which are more frequently accessed than the large, than the large files. So that's an optimization that can be done. Also, there is a format called CRF. That's used internally when, when you run raster analytics and you write a file out. Um, that is actually written using CRF because it allows multiple processes to write simultaneously to a single virtual image. Yeah. If you had one big TIFF file and had 100 processes and they say, write 100 processes to one TIFF file, ain't going to happen. So CRF is actually a way in which we can actually um, internally break the data into multiple what we call bundles, and then multiple processes can read, uh, can, can read that bundle. There's also a transposed option. This is actually for multidimensional data. What it actually does is it takes that 
image and sort of twists us on the side, and that allows us to very quickly go through temporal, lead, um, 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 temporal data or time, time, the time scale of data. A little thing on compression, there are various compressions, typically lossy, lossless, sorry, lossless, lossy, and controlled lossy. Um, there's a table there which we actually released um, um, as a paper recently, uh, which gives you some idea of the differences in performance and compressions. They're not significantly um, necessarily different. Uh, some of the formats are certainly better. For, as an optimization look, we've found um, to be the best compression. It's very fast to compress and very fast to decompress. So you'll see us utilizing Lurk quite extensively. Um, from an Im image conversion perspective, there are various ways that you can take your imagery and convert it to optimize it. Using export is one way, copy raster. The other one is to use optimized rasters. Optimized rasters is a tool that we provide. Uh, it's available in GitHub. It's actually just open source tool that utilizes GDAL behind the scenes. Uh, but it really simplifies the process of, uh, uh, of optimizing the data. You can literally point to a folder of data on your disk, or you can point to a folder in the cloud, and you can define where it's supposed to go. And you can define what template you want to use, and it'll actually go and do all the conversion in parallel, the optimization, uploading, everything is handled for you. Uh, and it can run on Windows and Linux. It actually also works in, 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 in things like Lambda. Uh, which is sort of um, serverless compute on the cloud if you really want to scale it up. So, so if you're converting lots of data, do have a look at optimized rasters. Getting data to the cloud, so you have data, obviously you can upload it file by file. That is one way to do it, using, for example, the portal. There are third-party tools like Cloudbury. Does Amazon have a CLI command line? Optimized rasters will do it. The other thing to consider is white, white glove services. What we mean by that is people like Amazon you go online and say, I want a 200, gigabyte, a 200 terabyte disk. The next day, a disk will be delivered to you. You plug it into your machine, copy all the data to it, put it back in its box, send it, and a week later, it appears on the cloud. Uh, it's a very inexpensive and quick way of getting large volumes of data into the cloud if you, if you want it. So just consider that as, you want, as you're moving to the, to, the, to the larger data sets. They actually even have Snowbook. They have other much bigger versions of this as well. So how to access the imagery from the cloud? Uh, you can directly use the VSI. And uh, uh, so this is basically what I call the, the VSI. It's to use, the, there's a, these are, when you define, just like you would define a file as C colon slash temp something, you can actually go slash slash VSI and access cloud uh, um, 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 data in, the, in the different, different types of clouds. You can use the ACS that I mentioned before that has a number of advantages of uh, providing multiple profiles. Although the, it, it has caching, it is not necessarily quite, there's some optimization that we still have to do with it. So we still sometimes refer, refer to using raster proxies. Raster proxies are really files which are created, the small XML files which embed all the information about the file sitting in the cloud, when ArcGIS sees it, it goes, oh, here's a raster, and it accesses it. Under the hood, it then goes and accesses the file in the cloud, but all the meta information about the image is actually in that raster proxy. So it, again, it reduces the amount of requests that have to go to the cloud. So that's really what a raster, pro a raster pro proxy is. And it can be implemented in multiple ways. Um, um, and so that's, that's what a raster, ra raster pro proxy is. So a raster proxy, as I said, there is a just, just a quick example of what it's doing. It's basically it's a GDAL. It, we use GDAL to access the file, but what we can do is create this raster, um, these, these raster proxies, and these raster proxies also contain a cache of the pixels that have been read are actually cached locally, so subsequent requests do not actually have to go back to the, to, to the cloud. Um, I told you, well, another thing to consider is how to reference the mosaic data sets in a raster. This, I think, is the last slide. Um, so when you actually create a, a mosaic data set, uh, a typical mosaic data set references a file. Didn't I just say at the beginning that it was not a good idea to reference a file? So how do we get around that? Well, you can use a file share. You can use the ACS. Um, you can use the raster proxies. Uh, you can directly create the mosaic data set instead of actually adding the data by pointing it to a file. You can point it directly to the VS, this, this VSI method. Or you can create raster proxies and then 
embed those into the Mosaic data set. What that means is that when you're managing the data, you're managing the data by pointing it at what looks like a local file. And then what you do is you create, you embed, there's a tool there called MD Tools. And what that will do, it'll actually take those raster proxies and put them inside the Mosaic data set. So now you have a Mosaic data set that doesn't actually reference anything, no files. It just has everything embedded into it. And you've got rid of the file system issue. Um, so another thing to realize is a lot of this is, um, is um, documented. I mean, all, all documented. Um, for different types of imagery workflows, I do highly recommend you go to this imagery workflows website. Uh, it is actually broken up into different um, 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 areas, such as managing imagery and analyzing imagery and exploiting imagery. And for each one of them, it then breaks it down into different things like managing elevation data, managing multispectral data. So it's broken down to really make it easy, easier for you to really under, fully understand everything that you need to do to complete a task. If you wanted to work with elevation data, find the imagery workflow about elevation data. It'll explain all the best practices, and it'll have all the references to learn lessons, to the help. Everything is kept uh, and, and together, together for you there. So do have a look at that. As I said at the beginning, this was going to get slower and was going to get faster and faster. I hope at the end it wasn't going too fast. Um, but hopefully you have a good idea of all the things. As I said, it can go from relatively simple. If you really want the simple option, create a mosaic data set, cache it, stick it into ArcGIS Online, you're done. Or you can go to the, as you scale it up bigger and bigger, you can get, it becomes obviously more and more complex. Everything is there for you, uh, um, but uh, yeah. OK, with that, uh, we go to questions. And before I go to the questions, one more thing. Please do fill out those, those uh, um, uh, in the app. Go to the app. Please fill it out. Your feedback is something that we do um, look at. We get feedback. And we do look at it and uh, um, change the presentations. And that's actually why this presentation is done this way. A lot, of, lot to cover. And I, broke, I was told something I go too fast everywhere. So I was going to change it a little bit. So we'll see whether that worked or not. OK. So with that, thank you very much, and we'll go for questions. Any questions? Chris, you always have a question, but go on, please. So you mentioned uh, that, what was it, the cloud format? Mm -hmm. Cloud optimized geotiff, yeah. And I actually recommend more MRF as opposed to COG. Um, it's actually faster to write and has, has better compression. Um, not that I've got anything against COG, it's just the different, different optimization. There's, in, in, in the community, there's a lot of people pushing COG at the moment. Uh, so you see a lot of people, oh, COG this, COG that. It's a good format. It really isn't anything more than tiled GeoTIFF. Um, but uh, it's, it's good, it's not just not quite as optimum. Yep, no problem. Yeah, so both those formats, MRF and, and, and uh, um, COG, you can use on, on premises. Uh, one, it's actually one of the advantages of MRF is that you can, remember I talked about these raster proxies? Um, so even on an on-premise system, what you could, very often the on-premise system has similar, has low, has low latency, especially if you're using a SAN or something like that to store the data. And one of the things with MRF is you can actually store the data on a SAN or a slower SAN device and the MRF file, remember I can split the files up, can be stored on a faster access device. So crawling and finding all the meta information goes really fast because everything is on, on, a, on a sort of very warm, uh, um, hot storage, <laughs> whilst the actual access to the pixels can be on the slower storage. So that's, that's a sort of example of where MRF becomes very powerful. Yes, Amber. So what? Okay. So if so, the question is related to: Is there a, is there a favorite tool for copying the data in, in, into the cloud? Definitely look at optimized rasters because that's going to do the, op, the conversion. You can just get optimized rasters and point it at the cloud, and it'll do the conversion and the upload in parallel. Okay. So that's. We just might the, not have the network. You may not have the network. In which case, run optimized rasters, but have the output to an external drive, and then send that external drive to the cloud. Or you know, take it to an office which has got a faster internet connection and use you know CLI upload. Uh, yeah. So. Yes. Yep. Think on that initial diagram you had. 
You talk about this one here. Yeah. Um, this is actually the, the best practice is to actually have it in front of them all. Okay. You don't actually have to have it. It's just, uh, um, yeah. I, to be honest, to be really honest, I'm not actually sure why we uh, why that's done. I have to ask somebody else. The diagram I always get is, has that in it, and I know they do it, but I'm not quite sure why. There might be somebody else who can give you a better answer to that one. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the rest of your evening. And if anybody else has only got any questions, I'll be here for a couple of minutes. Uh, so thanks a lot.